<coughs> Hello there and welcome back to Construction Grammar and its application to English. In this video I will talk about language variation. How does variation fit into the general picture of construction grammar as a theory of linguistic knowledge? What does it mean for a construction to be variable? I should point out from the very start that construction grammarians are relative latecomers to this idea that language variation is fundamental to linguistic knowledge. And I should also let you know that construction grammar has been criticized for being far too rigid in its formalisms, in the schemas that it posits. Um, these are sometimes seen as too rigid to account for all the variation that we see in language use. Now, in recent constructionist work, variation has been picked up as a really important and fundamental idea, and it's this kind of work that I will go over in this video. Now, um, let's start. And um, one thing that you perhaps remember from the first video is that I introduced the idea of constructions and constructs um, with this metaphor of a cookie cutter. So I said that constructions, they are the generalizations that speakers make that allow them to talk, and uh, they allow speakers to make constructs, instantiations of those generalizations. So the construction is the cookie cutter, and the constructs are the cookies that you can actually make with the construction. Now it turns out that's not quite accurate, okay? So a construction is not entirely like a cookie cutter. It's much more flexible than that. Okay, a construction does not just allow you to make one single thing that looks the same all the time. Rather, it allows you to produce things that vary, both in form and in meaning. Um, so in a nutshell, then, constructional variation means that there is more than one way to do it. Yeah, let's take an example, a very simple lexical construction, the uh, noun secretary. And um, you see here, this word is a lexical construction. It forms a four-meaning pair. It pairs a bit of sound with a bit of meaning, a concept. And, um, well, there's variation at both the formal pole and at the meaning pole. So at the formal pole, I pronounce this word secretary um, either as secretary, secretary, uh, or if I'm in a hurry, secretary. Yeah, so within the same speaker, there is variation. There are different ways of pronouncing secretary. There's also variation at the meaning pole. So I could be talking about a secretary of state. I could be talking about the secretary next door, or I could be talking about this piece of furniture that I saw in an antique store the other day. Right, so you might think, okay, words, they have different pronunciations, um, they vary slightly there, they have different meanings that are perhaps connected through polysemy, fine, what's the big deal? And um, is this only going on for lexical constructions or do we also have it in grammatical construction? Um, well, we do have it in grammatical constructions. Here's an example of the S genitive um, exemplified by phrases such as John's book, John's office, John's train, and so on and so forth. And you see that at the meaning pole here, um, well, the construction can express concepts such as possession, John's book, spatial contiguity, John's office or Germany's neighbors, temporal contiguity, yesterday's events, or causal contiguity, inflation's consequences. All right. Um, so, just as in lexical constructions we have this variability, we have it also in grammatical constructions. Now, this kind of variability has been very, very well researched in sociolinguistics. Okay? The idea of a variable is very much a classic idea in variationist linguistics. Um, there, the concept goes by the name of the sociolinguistic variable, which means two or more different ways of saying the same thing, and it's called the sociolinguistic variable because um, the two different ways of saying the same thing tend to be distributed across different groups of speakers. Okay, um, maybe 
speakers of different socioeconomic backgrounds, speakers of different ages, speakers of different genders, that kind of thing. Yeah, um, much research in this vein has focused on pronunciation. So do uh, um, you say coupon or coupon? Yeah. <clears throat> um, but it's not just about pronunciation. There are certain other variable um, choices that speakers have. For instance, when they report something that another speaker said, they could say, and I said, um, wow, that's great. Or they could say, and I was like, wow, that's great. Yeah, reporting something that I said earlier. And um, this choice between I said or I was like, that is something that tends to correlate with certain socio-linguistic uh, characteristics of the speaker. We also find variability in syntactic constructions. So here, the last example on this slide, that we have two relative clauses, one with an overt relativizer, that's the cat that I saw earlier, and one without such a relativizer, the cat, that's the cat I saw earlier. Right. Um, what now is the deal with construction grammar and variation in construction grammar? Um, if you've been following these videos, if you've heard this a hundred times, constructions are pairs of form and meaning. And um, variation in constructions can thus mean that there is a meaning that is paired with a range of forms, such as the pronunciations of secretary. It could also be a form with a range of different meanings, as in the S genitive. Typically, it's a many-to-many -many mapping yeah, with several formal variants and several meaning variants. However, there's also yet another way to think about variation in construction grammar, namely when you have an abstract formal pattern such as the noun phrase construction, it can be realized in different ways. So here are a bunch of different noun phrases um, and you see that their structure is well, not the same across these examples, yeah? Milk, an old donkey, the big one with the two horns, all my personal belongings, or my friend Amy who recently moved to Italy. Different structures, but instantiating the same um, overall construction, yeah, the noun phrase construction. Okay, let me elaborate on the topic of variation and construct syntactic constructions a bit more, and for this I have brought the example of relative clauses. Relative clauses, they can be realized in a range of different ways in English. Yeah, so all of these here are relative clauses. That's the cat that ran away. That's the cat that I saw yesterday. That's the cat that I told you about. That's the cat I saw yesterday. That's the solution suggested by our team of experts, and that's the proper thing to do. All of these you recognize as relative clauses, but structurally, they are slightly different things. Um, <clears throat> so let me walk you through the things that are different across these five examples or six examples. Um, let me start by recapitulating relative clauses. What's a relative clause? Well, in the broadest of terms, it's a clause that depends on a noun phrase, a nominal element. So here we have a relative clause construction, the cat that ran away, and you see that there are three principal parts. Uh, the cat, yeah, which is the head of the relative clause construction. Then in this example, there's a relativizer, a relative pronoun, that. And then we have the proper relative clause, ran away. And one thing that you'll often come across when you read up on relative clauses is there uh, that there's a, a gap in relative clauses, okay? Um, what's this gap metaphor doing there? Well, if you look at the relative clause, you see that the verb that it contains, ran, um, that's an intransitive verb. It requires a subject argument, but you see that in the relative clause, there is no subject argument in the default position right before the verb ran. Okay. Nonetheless, we understand that the thing, the entity doing the running, is the cat, Okay, which is expressed here in the head of the relative clause construction. So the gap 
um, is the subject of the relative clause. <clears throat> um, and so we're calling this structure here a subject relative clause that contrasts with object relative clauses in which the, the gap in the relative clause uh, represents the object argument of the main verb. So in the cat that I saw, yes, uh, that I saw yesterday, um, the cat is the direct object of the transitive verb see. Okay, there's not only subject relative clauses and object relative clauses, there are also things like oblique relative clauses where the gap represents an oblique of the, the, the verb in the relative clause and there are actually a bunch of other variants still like genitive relative clauses. Okay, <clears throat> why am I telling you all of this? Uh, because that's the first variable in relative clause constructions, the grammatical role of the gap in the relative clause. As a speaker of English, you know that in a relative clause construction, um, the gap can take on different grammatical roles like subject, object, oblique, genitive, and so on and so forth. Yeah, And uh, you can form relative clauses on the basis of that knowledge. A second variable uh, is the presence or absence of the relativizer. So in this example here, the cat that I saw yesterday, the relativizer is there. Yeah, We have a that relative pronoun, but uh, notice that we can leave it out. The cat I saw yesterday, that is a nice relative clause construction of English, um, but no relativizer is there. So that's another piece of variability. As a speaker of English, you know that in certain cases you can omit the relativizer. Notice that you can't just do that everywhere. Yeah, um, You can't do this in subject relative clauses, for instance. The cat ran away is a fine main clause, but it's not a fine relative clause construction. Yeah. Right. Um, a third variable. Uh, that's the finiteness of the relative clause. The examples that I've shown you so far all um, featured finite relative clauses, like this one here, the cat that I told you about. In this example, the relative clause I told you about um, is a fully finite clause if you add the gap. Okay, I told you about the cat. That's a fully finite, complete clause. Um, and that contrasts with non-finite relative clauses such as this one here, uh, the thing to do. Um, if you add the gap to the relative clause here, to do the thing, that is not a finite clause, it's a non-finite phrase, it's an infinitive phrase. So we have finite relative clauses, non-finite relative clauses, that's another variable and you you know that you can say this thing, yeah, um, but not others. A fourth variable is the presence or absence of an auxiliary, the auxiliary B, um, in constructions like this one here. Uh, the wine that was produced in Spain, that's another relative clause. And notice that here in the relative clause we have the form was, yeah, so that is an auxiliary. And we can leave that out and say the wine produced in Spain. <clears throat> and you notice that uh, this co-varies with the absence of the relativizer. So we can either say the wine produced in Spain or the wine that was produced in Spain. But uh, we can't just leave out one of these two. Yeah, The wine that produced in Spain is awful or the wine was produced in Spain is also not a good relative clause construction. All right. So, there are more variables, and if you're really interested in variability in uh, relative clauses, there's a book coming out by uh, Daniel Wichmann uh, with De Greuter, so do some googling and you'll find that, and uh, everything you ever wanted to know about relative clauses, it's in there. Right, um, so, the morale of all of this, as a speaker of English, you know how all of this works. Yeah.
Um, you know when it feels right to leave out the copula or to leave out the relativizer. You know what grammatical roles can be assigned to the gap. And you know what finite and non-finite structures can appear in relative clauses. Um, this means that your knowledge of language includes knowledge of variation. And this is kind of a big deal. Okay, I'll explain why it is such a big deal. Um, the traditional goal of linguistic research would be to find out what speakers know when they know a language. In fact, that's what I've been telling you in these videos all along. Okay, that's the goal. Um, typically, this is implemented as the ability to distinguish between grammatical and ungrammatical sentence level constructions. So, in, uh, in a way, you, you, you present people with sentences and say, can you say this? Or can't you say this? Okay, and the people go, yeah, that's a fine sentence. And this, no, that's not a fine sentence. Now, the troubling fact is that it's way more complicated than that. Linguistic knowledge is more complicated than that because it includes knowledge of variation. So speakers know which variants of a construction are appropriate in which contexts. Let me elaborate a little bit on that. Um, so we should not be asking, can you say X? Answer yes or no because that only tells us part of the story. But rather, what we're interested in is, okay, why do you sometimes say x index i and sometimes x index j? Okay, so why do you use this variant sometimes and on other occasions that variant? And unlike the first question, the second one is not really open to introspective analysis, okay? Um, Case in point, um, you do say uh, secretary and secretary yeah, on occasions, but can you really reflect on the situations in which you would say secretary or secretary? That's too hard. I can't do it. And um, if, if you can do it, you know, send me an email and uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So. If this is so hard, yeah, if we can't uh, use introspective analyses of knowledge of variation, how can we investigate it? Well, um, here we can really profit from the stock of knowledge that has been accumulated in quantitative sociolinguistics. Quantitative sociolinguistics is a research paradigm associated with the name of Bill Lebov, and uh, this paradigm has been going for a couple of decades, um, churning out research, and uh, there's really a lot to be learned from that. And uh, construction grammarians are starting to pick up these ideas. One um, fundamental finding is that linguistic variation is not random, it's highly predictable on the basis of language internal and language external so-called explanatory factors. Okay, so it's not a miracle, it's not something that is somehow mysterious, it's something that can be explained. Um, language external factors are things like speaker age, speaker ethnicity, gender, education, sexual orientation, all of these that don't necessarily have anything to do with the language that you're using. But there's also a number of language internal factors that play a role. So the phonological context, um, what phonemes occur to the left and to the right of a variable form. Yeah. Morphosyntactic context. Um, in what syntactic position do we have this um, variable uh, variable form? Syntactic complexity. Does, you know, um, if there's variability, does that variability vary uh, across simple syntactic environments or more complex syntactic environments? Marketness plays a role, and there are others. I'll talk about these in more detail in the next minutes. Right, just to give you an example of um, quantitative sociolinguistics as it has been lived and um, done uh, by Bill Lebov. So he studied copula omission in uh, African-American vernacular English as early as 1969. I wasn't born then. You probably weren't either, but the main ideas of what we're talking about today were around already then. 
Okay, so Bill above noticed that in Av you can omit the copula um, in sentences such as uh, she the first one or we on tape or he gonna try to get up or his wife supposed to be getting money. Yeah, and um, he also noticed that it's not that the copula is missing across the board, it's rather that sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. Now, um, you know, this being 1969, uh, the uh, consensus at that time was that, okay, Av speakers, they're just not too fussy about, you know, when to say, you know, when to insert a grammatical marker because Av is really something like bad English. Yeah. Um, Foolish idea, of course, and Labov noticed that um, av copula deletion is anything but random, but rather it's highly, highly systematic, okay? So you can deduce the rules of av from the appearance of the copula in authentic data. And his research question was, when do speakers of av choose the var zero variant rather than the overt copula variant? And what he came up with was uh, that there are a bunch of factors at work simultaneously, so that the zero variant is more likely when the subject is pronominal, yeah, something like he or she or I, um, the following element is gonna, yeah, something, a uh, sentence with gonna, fewer uh, overt copulas. Um, he also noticed that um, <clears throat> the zero variant was more frequent when the preceding word ended in a consonant. And there were certain language external factors at work. So the zero variant was used more when the speakers were interviewed as a group and not as an individual. Okay, so coming back to the question, when do speakers choose the zero variant rather than the overt variant? Um, <clears throat> Labov conceptualized this process as um, something that he called a variable rule. So B, the copula, is realized as zero, um, for instance, in a context such as before Ghana. But this rule is not categorical, it doesn't apply all the time, it only applies some 90% of the time. Okay, so it's probabilistic. It's a bit like, um, yeah, uh, if you have radioactive material, uh, a kilo of plutonium, I don't suggest that you should keep a kilo of plutonium, but if you do, you know, all the atoms in there, uh, you can be sure that there's a half-life to it. So uh, after a certain number of years, half of it will be gone, but you can't really say which of uh, the, the atoms will be gone. Yeah, that is probabilistic. <clears throat> okay, <laughs> let's leave the plutonium alone uh, and come back to variable rules. The traditional way of stating rules in phonology, and if you've had a phonology class, this is old news to you, is that you have something like X, and then uh, <clears throat> a bigger than sign, and uh, a Y, then a slash, and uh, something like A, underline b. What that means is that x changes into y if it happens to be located between a and b. Yeah, um, So a change happens in a certain context. An example of this, um, I added this example here from German, d is realized as t at the end of a word. So that's the famous German final devoicing that you'll hear me doing on occasions. Okay, so Hund, for instance, that ends is a German word that ends in a D, but um, we pronounce it as a T at the end. Okay, rules of this kind are thought to apply categorically all the time, and uh, variable rules, they don't apply all the time. They only apply, say, 60% of the time, 80% of the time, 90% of the time. And um, since they don't apply all the time, they have to include some kind of information about the determining factors and their relative strengths, okay? So a way in which this variable rule 
of add copula deletion could be written is b is realized as zero in the following contexts with with the following probabilities okay so uh, having a pronominal subject uh, <clears throat> gives you a 50 50 chance of the thing being deleted um, nominal subjects there is a lower chance of uh, copula being deleted following elements if Ghana follows, there is a high chance of uh, the copula being deleted. Uh, lower chances with ing clauses, with uh, adjectives, locatives, and lower still with NPs. And then there's also phonological information. So if the following word, uh, no, if the preceding word ends in a consonant, you have a higher chance of deletion than when the word ends in a vowel. Okay. So, depending on the respective values in each of these angular brackets, each copula speech event has a certain probability of being realized as zero. Um, so, it's probably not the case that speakers you know, perform these calculations somehow in their minds. Um, but if they do so, you know, unconsciously perhaps, something of that kind is going on and determining whether or not a speaker is pronouncing the copula in a certain speech event. Right, so knowledge, well, knowledge of language must, on some level, include knowledge of variation, that is, knowledge in which situation which variant is most appropriate. Okay, um, did I just say that? Speaker's knowledge of constructions um, includes subconscious knowledge of when to use which variant. And um, the variable rules of the kind that I've, I've shown you a minute ago, they represent models of this kind of knowledge. Yeah? How that works in practice, that's very much an open-ended question. But um, we can state for the minute that speaker's knowledge of language includes knowledge of variation and that is a big deal. Now let's turn to a related topic namely variation between constructions. Um, so so far I've talked about variation within constructions now we're turning towards variation between constructions which has been a major um, research effort recently. So the basic scenario of studies that look at this is that you have two constructions with similar meanings, such as, for instance, the English genitive alternation, the two genitive constructions, the S genitive on the one hand and the off genitive on the other hand. And you see that at the meaning pole, they can convey, convey very similar things, possession, spatial contiguity, temporal contiguity, causal contiguity, and others. Um, Another case of two constructions with similar meanings is the so-called dative alternation, um, the ditransitive construction, which means an agent transfers a theme to a recipient. I talked about this in chapter and two on uh, argument structure constructions. And the prepositional dative construction here, um, which has the prototypical meaning of an agent causing a theme to move towards a recipient. So the meaning here is not identical, but it's overlapping, so that there are cases in which the meanings that a speaker wants to express could be equally well served by uh, one construction or the other, so that they have to make a choice. Yeah, And this making a choice is very much uh, yeah, it is thought to proceed along the lines that Lebov has uh, outlined in his study of av copula deletion. Yeah, that's the kind of process that is thought to be going on. So, <clears throat> we have pairs of constructions that show semantic overlap. Um, these constructions, we can imagine, are connected through subpart links in the constructicon. And when a speaker wants to convey a meaning that could be expressed by either of the two constructions, they have to make a choice. And this choice is not random, but rather it's governed by language internal factors and language external factors. So let's look at the dative alternation in a bit more detail, because this 
uh, construction pair has been studied um, intensively. Yeah, some would say it's been studied to death in the literature. Um, but we can we have certainly learned a whole lot about knowledge of variation through studies of the date of alternation. So what are the factors that underlie speakers' choices in the date of alternation? Um, let's take an example and see if we can deduce from our own um, intuitions. Okay, intuitions, they're not the devil's work entirely. Yeah, we can still use them. Okay, here, what would you choose? Person A says, do we have any more wine? Person B says, no, I'm afraid there's nothing left. Person A um, responds, but we had that last bottle of Merlot. And then person B says, yes, but I gave John that last one, or I gave that last one to John. Which one would you prefer? Okay, I'll tell you what I'll prefer. Um, I prefer the second. Yeah, I gave that last one to John. Why? Uh, for information packaging reasons, essentially. So you see that that last bottle of Merlot that has been already mentioned, so it's um, common ground, it's known information. And so through the principle of end focus, I would rather take the prepositional dative, which allows me to place John, the new information, uh, at the end. Yeah. So in keeping with the principle of end focus, speakers typically choose the prepositional dative in this uh, context. Let's contrast this with this example here. Do we have any more wine? Uh, person B responds, no, I'm afraid there's nothing left. And then person A says, but it's John's birthday and I need to bring something. And then person B says, yes, well, you could um, give John these chocolates or give these chocolates to John. Hmm? Which one would you prefer? Again, um, in this context, I would prefer the transitive, the first option, because John is already uh, part of the mutually known common ground, and the chocolates are not. So I put those at the end. <clears throat> right, so um, a first variable then in the choice between prepositional dative and um, uh, ditransitive is the variable of givenness. Is the theme given and the recipient new? <clears throat> in that case, choose the prepositional dative. If we have a given recipient and a new theme, in that case, go for the ditransitive. Yeah. But there's more variability. Um, okay, but before I introduce the other variables, let me talk a bit more about givenness and other related variables. Givenness as a variable is closely correlated with three other morphosyntactic variables, namely pronominality, because reference of pronouns tend to be given, and this has tangible consequences. So, um, for instance, the ditransitive has a constraint that the theme must not be pronominal. Yeah, you could give John it. That sounds a bit terrible. There are varieties of English in which it works, but um, standard varieties, not so much. Definiteness. That's also correlated with givenness. Reference of definite NPs tend to be given. Yeah. Um, so um, <clears throat> if we have a definite NP, um, that makes the prepositional dative a bit more likely. If we have a definite theme, uh, if we have an indefinite theme, it makes the ditransitive a bit more likely. And also length figures in this regard. So short phrases, they tend to be given. Yeah, Ultra short phrases, they're pronouns and so they're given all the time. Okay, so givenness correlates with pronominality, definiteness, and length, syntactic weight. Moving on to other variables here. A second variable is semantic in kind, um, namely what type of transfer are we talking about? Um, we can distinguish between concrete transfers, yeah, gives John some chocolates or give some chocolates to John, that both works. Um, we have intended transfers, promise John some chocolates, promise some chocolates to John. Again, both things work. And we have metaphorical transfers, give John a shock, give a shock to John. Mm. Yeah, 
not really, right? Um, so here it seems that there is a semantic constraint on the use of the prepositional dative construction that biases speakers in favor of the ditransitive. So, yeah, um, variable two. If there's a metaphorical transfer, there's a bias towards the ditransitive. Animacy, another usual suspect in variational studies. Um, <clears throat> so, when the animate when the recipient is animate, as in give John some chocolates or give some chocolates to John, again, both constructions are possible, but with recipients, there is a constraint, namely, uh, the prepositional dative is possible, uh, but inanimate recipients with the ditransitive are highly marked. Okay, It is impossible with concrete transfers, it is possible with metaphorical transfers, but that's yeah, um, a different story. So we have a bias here of inanimate recipients biasing people towards the prepositional dative. <clears throat> Another variable that I should mention is a processing factor, namely structural priming. Any one variant, the prepositional dative or the ditransitive, is more likely if that variant has been produced or heard before. Okay, Human beings, their habits, uh, they're, they're creatures of habit, yeah? And so if I've heard a variant before, that is somehow active in my mind and I tend to reproduce that. So, <clears throat> where does this leave us? Um, the conclusion is that whenever speakers have the opportunity to express a meaning through a set of alternative constructions, their choices are governed by several language internal and external factors, and these factors are related to different things, yeah, to, to processing, things like priming or syntactic complexity. They're linked to pragmatics, givenness, yeah. They're linked to semantics, animacy, and they're linked to phonology. There's something called the horror equi, the fear of the same. So, um, yeah, if speakers uh, can avoid pronouncing two difficult sounds right after one another, yeah? Pronouncing two um, interdental fricatives uh, right next to one another, they'll typically go for the easier variant where you have dissimilar sounds next to one another. All of this is subconscious knowledge of language. It's your knowledge of linguistic variation. Um, and um, yeah, as I said, that makes the study of linguistic knowledge a lot more complicated than it was thought to be in the past. I'm coming to a last point here in this video, namely variation between groups of speakers. <clears throat> um, construction grammar research has infiltrated, it has started to infiltrate studies of world Englishes, yeah, varieties of English. Um, and you notice that, well, traditionally, construction grammarians, they try to model the speaker, the, mo the knowledge of an individual speaker. Um, so what business do they have studying varieties of English, yeah, studying very different ways of using the English language? Hmm. Um, a question that has to be raised in this context is, well, whose knowledge do we want to model? Yeah, your own, a standard speaker, some kind of ideal speaker, oh my god, uh, idealized speaker here. Um, should we maybe find a compromise between different varieties? I'll leave this for you to, to ponder, yeah? Whose knowledge do we want to model? Okay. Um, finding a compromise between different varieties of English, that uh, is probably a very difficult project because there are very uh, varying things that, that people say around the world. So here are some features that I picked from the E-Wave Atlas of Variation in English. Uh, there's no one does it anymore. Yeah? Relative clause construction that is not there in standard varieties of English. This our problem is very serious. Determine a doubling. Yeah? Um, it is found in African varieties of English and in the German of 
former Chancellor Helmut Kohl. Um, I eat my lunch perfect without auxiliary half, Singapore English. Um, this is better as the other one, comparative as. Uh, the boys was there, Mary weren't, it was weren't, polarity split. Um, they ride bikes is what they do. Having a full clause is a cleft focus phrase. And uh, as I said it before, this is a problem, so a resumptive it in the as clause there. So, why am I showing you this? Okay, I'm showing you this because it shows that there's variation in relative clauses, noun phrases, the perfect, comparison, negation, clefting, in pronoun usage, and all of these are fundamental and basic domains of grammar. Yeah, they are the meat and potatoes of grammar, and in all of these, there is variation. There is not a common core of English that would, you know, maybe the, the, the kind of thing that construction grammarians might go and model this common core. Hmm. Bad idea. Right, so where does this leave us? Um, let's turn to the dative alternation once again, because as I said, uh, this thing has been studied a lot, yeah. And um, you remember the slide from a few minutes ago. There are certain variables governing the date of alternation, givenness of theme and recipient, uh, semantic type of the transfer, animacy of theme and recipient, and structural priming, among uh, several others. Okay, so these are not just the, not just these variables are at issue. Now, what has been studied with regard to this uh, alternation is whether there are differences across different varieties as far as these variables are concerned. So, um, Joan Bresnan and colleagues have looked at the dative alternation, for instance, across American English and New Zealand English, and um, they have found that there was a difference, um, for instance, with regard to the length of the recipient. Sorry. <coughs> ah, okay. Um, so, in both American English and New Zealand English, um, there's a preference for the prepositional dative if the recipient is long. Okay? So, in American English, John gave the book to his favorite Aunt Mary is preferred over John gave his favorite Aunt Mary the book. However, this preference is stronger in New Zealand English. Yeah. Uh, so here, New Zealanders, they are more reluctant to say John gave his favorite Aunt Mary the book, and they're more biased towards John gave the book to his favorite Aunt Mary. When I read this, I was surprised. I was really surprised. Why was I surprised? Well, because I thought, okay, this end um, weight principle that you put long stuff at the end of a clause. That is a processing factor that has to do with your brain, which has a hard time keeping stuff in working memory while you process a sentence. And so to make things easier for yourself and for your hearer, you put long stuff at the end of a sentence. Now, if that's the case, and if it's the case that the brains of Americans and New Zealanders are approximately the same, yeah, then this factor should come out exactly the same across the two varieties. However, it doesn't. Yeah. Now, I'm willing to discard the explanation that New Zealanders' brains might, you know, not quite be there. Yeah. Um, they have the same brains. Um, so it must be that the two constructions are simply conventionalized differently across the two. Uh, varieties. And so that must mean this forms part of linguistic knowledge. Yeah, It's not just processing, it's not just something that emerges because of the way our minds are set up. Rather, it is part and parcel of linguistic knowledge. And in a way, that's very good news for uh, construction grammar. Here's another example. Um, this gives the plot a new twist um, with an inanimate recipient, yeah, metaphorical example, um, that is dispreferred by Americans. Americans like these literal transfers. Um, New Zealanders are a bit more relaxed about that, okay? More metaphors in New Zealand. And again, yeah, 
what does that point to? It simply points to that these constructions are conventionalized differently across the two varieties. Fun stuff. So, summing up here, variation across varieties, um, the factors that govern the date of alternation, yeah, given this animacy, type of recipient, a uh, type of transfer uh, priming, all of that comes out in uh, New Zealand English just as it does in American English. However, some of the factors are not equally strong across the two varieties. And this is evidence that the ditransitive and the prepositional dative are conventionalized differently in the two varieties. Okay, summing up, <clears throat> variation, it's a fundamental thing, and construction grammarians have disregarded variation for far too long. It's high time that we you know, um, uh, take on this challenge of accounting for variation in linguistic knowledge. Every healthy living language varies. Yeah, it's a normal thing. It's a good thing. And uh, constructions exhibit variation both at the meaning pole and at the formal pole. The big um, message in this video, I think, is this. Uh, knowledge of language includes knowledge of variation, knowledge of how a construction can vary. So speakers' choices between two variants of a construction, uh, they're governed by explanatory factors. We can investigate this knowledge of variation. And uh, it's also the case that speakers' knowledge of a construction tend to be uh, different across different varieties of the same language. So the constructicon of a speaker of American English is a little different from the constructicon of a New Zealander or someone speaking another variety of English. All right, so the next video is really going to be the last one, and it's going to be about constructional change, a topic that is near and dear to my heart. All right, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.